Shalom, and welcome to Via Havta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. When you look and evaluate your life, would you say that you have a triumphant life, living in victory, accomplishing those things that God is exceedingly pleased with? I believe that most people, even most believers, true followers of Messiah Yeshua, they're not living a triumphant life. Why is that? because they are not following the instructions that our Lord and our Savior gave to us. It's only when we submit, and we do so prophetically, meaning this, we understand the revelation of God, we receive that revelation, and we apply it to our life. Then we will know triumph. But if we're trying to get God to do what we want, we're going to experience frustration and not triumph but defeat because our mindset our wants our desires apart from him they are against his purposes his will so let me ask you again are you living that triumphant life well take out your bible and look with me to the book of matthew and chapter 21 the book of matthew and chapter 21 now, we have seen that Yeshua has spoken frequently in a repetitive manner about going to Jerusalem, doing so for Passover. And there he would be betrayed. He would be condemned unjustly, but nevertheless to death. And ultimately, he would die, but on that third day, raise again. And here's what we need to see. In the scripture that we're going to be looking at in this time of study, most scholars refer to it as Messiah's triumphant entry. And why was it triumphant? Not necessarily because what happened, but because he was pursuing his father's will. He came to Jerusalem to do why he was sent into this world to accomplish and therefore, that is a principle that you and I need to apply to our life, that we pursue the will of God, that we go to the locations that God wants us to do in order to fulfill what God has called us to do. That is a triumphant life. It doesn't matter how others respond, what others say about it, what is accomplished from that in the short term or from a human standpoint, none of those things are ultimately important. What's important is, are you honoring your Lord and your Savior? Are you walking in obedience? Is your motivation to glorify your Savior? Well, look with me, as I said, we're in Matthew chapter 21, and we're going to begin in verse 1. We read here, and when they drew near to Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem, no question, historically, Jerusalem was a very important city from God's perspective. Many important things, for example, the temple was in Jerusalem. But what we need to realize is this. It was part of God's plan, his purposes in the past, and it is certainly that city, the holy city of Jerusalem, is part of God's purposes, his plans, and let's be more specific, his kingdom purposes and plans for the future. To the extent that the eternal state of the kingdom of God is called the new Jerusalem. So if anyone tells you, oh, Jerusalem is not important anymore, that's in the past, 
We need not be concerned with land, but only these, these futuristic things and spiritualize them and such. You run from such a false teacher. You cannot look at the word of God and arrive at Jerusalem, that city, that it's not important to God because when you study the scripture prophetically, it is at the center of God's will. The good things that yet he has to establish, to bring about. So look again, verse 1. And when they drew near into Jerusalem, and they came into, and it's a city. It is Bethphage. And Bethphage, as it says here, is to the Mount of Olives, meaning it's located at that location. They were entering into that city, and that city was located there on the Mount of Olives. Now, when we read prophecy, especially the book of Zechariah, and by the way, Zechariah's prophecy is going to figure in greatly in, in this study. And what we see is that Zechariah tells us that when God brings about victory for his covenant people, when he defeats the enemy and he establishes that kingdom, we know that Messiah, he is going to arrive where? At the Mount of Olives. In fact, when we look at the end of his ministry, when we look at the first chapter of the book of Acts prior to his ascension, the scripture says, in the same way that he ascended back into the heavens from the Mount of Olives, when he returns in order to accomplish his kingdom purposes and establish that kingdom, he's going to come to the Mount of Olives. So, Always the Mount of Olives, it is relevant for understanding the work, the purpose of our Lord and Savior, our Redeemer. So he's coming to this place, the Mount of Olives. Then look at the second part of, of verse 1. Then Yeshua, he sent two disciples. Now, my hope is if you are a frequent watcher of this program or our internet sites, you will be reminded that two numbers in the scripture, usually there are exceptions, but the vast majority of time, numbers are important in the word of God. They have relevance. They convey a message to us. And the number two frequently speaks about two different opinions. And this is what we're going to see here. The disciples, they have one expectation of why they entered into this place. And Jerusalem, in a general sense, they're going to have another confused understanding of what's going on at this time. Because they're not looking at it, nor the disciples, nor the city of Jerusalem, looking at it from a prophetic perspective. And what the scripture is telling us is this. When we do not look at something from a pro prophetic perspective, we're going to miss out on the message of God. So he sends these two disciples, verse 2, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey having been tied. Now here again, it's important that we pay attention to the grammar. The grammar is part of the scripture. And this word, having been tied, is in the perfect tense. What does that mean? Well, it means that this is something that just didn't begin that day, but there is a historical aspect to this. And we know it's prophetic. Zechariah, many, many years before, he spoke, and we'll come to this in a moment, about this donkey and this colt. So it began in the past. It is relevant now, but here's the key. The perfect speaks about something that extends into the future. And sometimes that future is an eternal future, meaning it has eternal implications. And that's what we see here. This donkey has a purpose. He is going to be used by God for an eternal 
purpose. So he says, you will find a donkey having been tied and a colt with her. Then he says, after loosening, bring, you bring to me. And look now at verse 3. And if something to you, someone should say, you say, you respond, in other words, that the Lord, that the Lord these had need of. So notice, Yeshua, and for the most part, we're going to see that Yeshua, that is Jesus of Nazareth, that he's spoken of here as with his name, Yeshua. But, but infrequently in this passage, we're going to see the term Lord. And this speaks about his authority. And he's coming here under the authority of his heavenly Father. And when can we be under the authority and the provision of our heavenly Father? Very simply, when we are walking in his will, when we are concerned about his purposes. So it says... If anyone should say anything to you, you respond, you say that the Lord, and then the word order is unique. The next word is these, referring to that donkey and this colt, that these he has need of. Verse 3, second part, and immediately he will send them. Verse 4. Now, I mentioned to you that if you are not looking at prophecy, the books in the scripture that are prophetic in nature, you're not going to have the right mindset in order to understand most of the new covenant. The new covenant, it uses prophecy to a great extent. And we see it right here. Look at verse 4. And this, and then there's a word. Now, many of the modern translations, because they use an inferior text, a text that has so many of the verses that I would say are original, are authentic, what the authors wrote down in this inferior text, the Nestle Allen, many verses, many words just, just evaporate. They're not there. And here we have a very important word, and that is the word for all. Something in its entirety. And this is what Messiah came to do. To fulfill entirely. To fulfill all of God's work. What he was sent into this world to do. So this all took place. And here again. It took place. It happened. It came about. However your Bible translates it. But what's important is once again. What's happening here, this word for it came about, it happened, it took place, it's once more in the perfect. And what's the perfect? It speaks about something that has, has a origin in the past, it's relevant still today, and it goes on into the future. And this has a kingdom implication to it. All of this, I want to say it again, and all of this Happened. It came about in order, and this is what was important to Messiah, in order that the word of the prophet, the word through the prophet, would, would be fulfilled, saying, verse 5, say to the daughter of Zion. Now, we sometimes speak of the word son, but the word daughter, feminine, and when the word of God emphasizes a female, a woman, a daughter, it gives the context of scripture one of a redemptive context. So this tells us when it says, O daughter of Zion, it's speaking about something that's going to bring redemption to this city, Jerusalem. And through this work, ultimately, Jerusalem is going to be transformed into Zion. And once more, if you listen frequently to our, our teachings, you'll remember that Zion is a kingdom word, and it speaks about the excellency of God. That same word, Zion, in a different form, it becomes Mitsuyan, which means excellent. 
So the excellency of God, referring to his blessings, his promises, there's a connection between Jerusalem and these things, but until redemption happens, these excellent things, his blessings, are not going to be realized by his people. So we read, say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your king. This is so vital. Because the king is another word that speaks about Messiah. Frequently in Judaism, we speak about King Messiah. We know from from many passages, the book of Revelation, for example, in chapter 19, it speaks about Yeshua, that is Jesus being the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So here in this passage of scripture, it says, behold, your king comes to you humbly and riding upon a donkey, the colt, the foal of, and there's a change. If you just look at the Hebrew text, it is the foal of a female donkey. So that's true, but we find that, that the Greek text, it quotes the Septuagint, And it has a little different word there. See, this word speaks of a beast of burden, one that suffers in order to accomplish its objective. It is a beast that is placed underneath a burden. It is weighed down. And this is so informative to us to help us understand what Messiah is going to do that he's going to have a burden placed upon him. So the change from the Hebrew text to the Septuagint in the Greek language gives us insight. So he's going to ride upon this, this donkey and the colt, the foal of a beast of burden. Verse 6. And the disciples went, and here again, this word went, is in the passive voice, meaning they didn't do this of their own initiative. It wasn't their idea to go into the city and do this. It was because something, and what was that? The instructions, the commandment of Messiah brought this about. It caused, and that's why the passive is there. They're doing this out of obedience. The disciples went and did, and I like this, just as just as Yeshua had commanded them. And they brought, look now at verse 7, they brought the donkey and the colt, and they, they spread upon them their garments. And he set upon them, verse 8, and the large crowd, they went and did something, it says this large crowd, they, they also spread their own garments, not just on the, the, the beat beast of burden, this, this colt and its, its donkey, but also others. They spread their garments, and hear this, on the way. That word way is very important. It speaks about not just any way. In fact, if you look here, it says on the way. And the word way, the first believers, they were called part of the people who were of the way. That's how they were identified in the book of Acts, the people of the way. And the way has to do with the will of God, the purposes of God, the plans of God. So this word, and we see both on on the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the Feast of Tabernacles, a special reading is read on that Shabbat that falls in the midst of these holidays. And we read about the one that God would send. And he is called the way. And it's this one, the way, and Messiah is the way, the truth, and the life that's going to bring about the fulfillment of God's purposes. So they spread out upon the way their garments. And others, what did they do? They cut branches from trees and they laid them down once more on the way. 
Now, this is important because cutting branches from the trees, this is usually done during the Feast of Tabernacles. Not this time before Passover, but in the fall of the year, this is the spring. So why were they doing it? Because this cutting of branches in doing this shows a dependence, a trust, a reliance. And what the scripture is saying is that these individuals, they were honoring Messiah. They were glorifying him, treating him as he is, the king, the king of kings. And they were also responding to him as one who they were absolutely dependent upon. And they wanted to demonstrate, this is what it means when they cut the branches from the trees and spread them out flat upon the road. Verse 9. And the crowd, the ones following before and the ones going after. So there were people following him. And some were following him, but they were in front of him. And others were in the back. But here's what's important. Three times in regard to this crowd, those who are going before, those who are following after, the definite article is there. And this is to make these individuals emphatic, meaning it puts a mark from the text upon them as a way of saying this is the right behavior. And what were they doing? Notice they were crying out. Now, again, I pay attention to grammar. And there's a change. It's not the normal, simple past tense. It's not the perfect tense that we've related, but it's the imperfect. And this shows when the imperfect is used here, it tells the reader to anticipate a change. That, that what's happening now is not, hear that carefully, is not going to continue. There's going to be a change. Now, here he comes to Jerusalem. We call this, as I've already alluded to you, his triumphant entry. But, but all of this triumph, this honoring, this, this, this laying down their garments, going and getting branches to, to share with others their trust in him, their reliance. This is well and fine now. It's proper. But, but Jerusalem isn't going to remain like this. We're going to see that there's a change, and that changes, that Jerusalem's going to turn against him. But here, they're behaving perfectly. They were saying, Hoshia. Now, Hoshia is the word to save us. The word na is a term of, of imploring someone, requesting. So, Hoshana now to the son of David. And blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. These are prophetic scriptures from the book of Psalms, from that section of Psalms that are read on holidays and each new month called the Hallel. And the word Hallel in Hebrew means praise. So these are verses of praise that acknowledge, and by the way, when we say them in the synagogue, you stand to say that. So we read, Hoshana now to the son of David. This is acknowledgement of him being Messiah. And blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And he enters into Jerusalem and pay very close attention to this next word. Now, again, this is the triumphant entry. And words... The scripture contains words, and these words denote, convey to the reader some very, very important truth. And the word I want to focus in on is the word for, it relates to a shaking. Now, today, there is a, a piece of equipment that monitors earthquakes. What do earthquakes do? They shake the earth, the ground. And there's what's called a seismograph that measures that shaking. And the word seismograph, where that comes from, is a word that appears right here. It's a Greek origin, this word seismograph. 
It measures, it graphs out, it, it reveals the shaking. And what we see here is this. He entered into Jerusalem and all the city was shaking again in the passive. Something caused the city to shake. And that shaking is always in the scripture. It's for the purpose of grabbing our attention to say something that's happening is very significant. So all the city was, was shaking. And, and it was saying, the city speaks of it collectively. The city was saying, who is this one? That's the important question that you need to answer. Who is this one? He's not just a prophet. He's not just a miracle worker, but he is the Savior. And without receiving him, you will have no triumph in your life. And I'm speaking about eternal triumph, eternal victory. He is the one, the Redeemer, the one who can pay the price, and he's already done so, when he laid down his life upon that, that cross in order to give us eternal victory that comes and begins with forgiveness. And it's that forgiveness that saves us and gives us life eternal, victory, victory forever and ever. So the city was shaken and they said, who is this one? Last verse, verse 11. And the crowd was saying, here again, very interesting, the imperfect. Oh, Jerusalem, that day they were saying the right thing, but in a few short days, things were going to change. They were saying, this one is Yeshua. Notice, the prophet, not just a prophet, but the prophet, the one that the scripture speaks of who would speak truth and victory into the world. The prophet, the one from where? The one from Nazareth or Nazareth in English. And this speaks about also a change because that word Nazareth comes from a word which means a, a little sprout of a tree that's from a stump that appeared to be dead. But that sprout happens and there's going to be a great change. This is Yeshua, the prophet, the one from Nazareth of Galilee. And Nazareth of Galilee, the word Galilee means to reveal something. And that's why he came in to Jerusalem that day, to reveal who he was, the Savior, and what he was going to do, and that is to offer to all people redemption. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Thank you.